Hello everybody, PT Pop here with all four lobes of my brain securely bound behind my back. And today I'm going to talk about a series of videos I found on YouTube called Life is Meaningless. Stay tuned. We got the gold on your own tracy. So of life and warmth and delight. He's almost got me aroused here. Before I get to today's 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 main topic. I'd like to ask each and every one of you to support my channel. You can do this in a couple of ways. Now, the way you can support my channel for free, absolutely free, and you won't have to pull out your wallet or write a check, is to like my videos, give them a thumbs up, subscribe, and share. I've got almost 10,000 subscribers on here, and if I can get it, at least half of you to, to tell everybody about my channel and bring people to my channel, especially people who've worked in the corporate world and are disillusioned or have worked in call centers, tell them about my channel. Another way you can support my channel is through Patreon. I've got a brand new Patreon channel, and I offer memberships. And on my memberships, you can, you can hear a brand new podcast called Call Center Survivor. You can see behind-the-scenes shots of making my music videos. You can hear songs that I've written. I've got a brand new song called Call Center Survivor, and a whole lot more is going to be coming up. So I appreciate your support, those of you who have subscribed to my channel and have liked my videos. But to keep this channel going, I'm going to need all the support and all of your patronage. So thank you very much for that. So in, in the past, I was uh, thumbing through some videos on YouTube, on the YouTubes. And I found a series of videos called Life is Meaningless. Let me switch over to that. So these Life is mean Meaningless videos have a theme. It's usually one person sitting behind the wheel of their car. They're alone in the car. The car's not moving. And they are in sad shape. They're, they're very depressed. They're very disillusioned with life. They're very upset with the circumstances in life in general as well as in their own specific life. And some of them are heartbreaking. You know, I've been in, you know, some bad places myself, much like many of these people. Now, these are people of all ages, of all walks of life. You can see here's an African-American woman, a middle-aged white guy, a young kid, another middle-aged white guy. Life is random and meaningless. A woman. So you've got men, women of all walks of life. And a couple of them are pretty heartbreaking, like this guy here. Life has no meaning. No meaning whatsoever. We're here to die. I'm fresh out of high school. I'm homeless. Okay, that's just one example. There's one on here that, uh... It's feeling different. I always feel like I'm left out of things. Growing up, I used to always care about people and and put others first. When I used to go out and play with my friends at the park or when there's snack time in class, I used to always go to the corner store and buy a lot of snacks and drinks. And when I would get back to the park, I would share with everybody and everybody would be happy and I would make sure I give everybody a bag of chips and if they didn't want something to eat I would give them a drink and you know when we're all kids we just eat chips and drink hugs back when chips used to be a quarter and a and a small hug drink would be a quarter were the good times and I remember during class when I would bring a snack and when some of my classmates didn't have nothing to eat and they asked me and they asked me if they could get some. I would give them some of my snack, whether it's chips, cookies, or whatever I had. But I remember there were a few days where I didn't have any money. I couldn't buy my own chips and drinks. And when they had snacks and we were all playing at the park, when they had something to drink, I would ask them, can I get some chips? And they would say no. And that really got to me because all these all this time, I got y'all backs. I, I would share with everybody. But then when I'm down, when I don't have any money, when I have nothing to eat, nobody cared about me. I just... Well, that's, that's, that's the way it works. That's the way it works in this life. 
I hate to say that, but that's the way it is. People will use you and throw you aside as quick as look at you. That's how life works, kid. And uh, it doesn't get any better. You really got to stand out, stand up on your own two feet and learn to be a dick. And you have to just stop sharing, share, share um, sparingly with, with certain people you know will appreciate it and share without the hope that somebody's going to do something for you in return. Because number one, most people aren't going to return the favor. I mean, I found that out. I've seen it millions of times in my own life. But you get the idea. There's there's other videos on here. It's it's a lot of young people. It's it's a heart heartbreaking, gut wrenching, people of all walks of life talking about how life sucks, how life is meaningless. And it led me down this path of thinking to myself, how did we get here? You know, how did we get to this place where so many people are alone? They're lonely. You know, some people will say what well, the pandemic. Some people will say it's the government. Some people will say it's society. And me not being a sociologist or a psychologist or psychiatrist, you know, I, I don't know the exact reason as to why this is all happening. Now, when I was the, like that young man that was on here, when I was his age, I'd go over to my sister's house, and my sister is 12 years older than me, so I'd be over there at her house in high school and college break, and they would get this catalog in the mail called Sharper Image. And Sharper Image, here I'll switch over to, to the, ca the catalog here. Sharper Image, is, if you haven't seen it, is a catalog of, well, now as an adult man, it's a catalog of junk. <laughs> it's just a catalog of just garbage crap that you don't need. It's, it's just pages and pages and pages and pages of trinkets and gadgets and crap that people can't afford don't need, and once you get it, it breaks, and, and you throw it away. And when I would see this magazine in my, my sister's house, and this is not knocking my sister, this is just, this is where I first saw it, I would get really like, oh man, they must have a lot of money, they, they can, they, they've got the sharper image catalog, you know, and they're, you know, they didn't have any of the stuff in their house, but I would think, boy, I could be happy if I could just have some of this stuff, I mean, I mean, oh my God, if I could only have you know, oh, a bestseller. This is the bestseller. These are the, these are the true night vision binoculars by Sharper Image. <laughs> That's what everybody needs. I need night vision binoculars. And when you're younger, you think this stuff is going to make you happy. Number one and number two, you think it's going to, it's something you're going to buy because you're in a different income level bracket, and you're gonna, you're, you feel like you're something important and special. And the sad thing about catalogs like this is that it's just designed to sell you garbage. This is all garbage. Look at the, like these golf ball finding glasses. <laughs> Who needs a golf ball set of golf ball finders? I mean, my uh, my um my father in law played golf his whole life, probably up until about a year before he passed away. And uh, he always found the ball fine. His eyes were probably worse than mine. He always found his ball. I, I don't understand why people need special balls for this. How about this over here? You got the the Planetarium Projector by Sharper Image. I think that's what we all need to be happy is this Planetarium Projector. Yeah. And then you've got the, uh, oh, oh, here's something that all the kids will need. Toys and games. This is the Virtual Pong by Sharper Image. And they, they depict these things as if everybody is having a blast using them. It's a lot of fun. You need to have it. It's something that you need to have to be happy. Look at this little robot, cute little walkie-talkie spy robot. Okay. And, and I remember as a kid thinking, being so depressed that I couldn't afford this stuff. I couldn't wait to be an adult so I could get a job and go out and buy this stuff. And I'd be happy and, uh, oh, wow, if I could only have an NFL hover helmet, <laughs> you know. Oh, man. Now, I do have one of these. This does come in handy. Nose and ear hair trimmer. I didn't buy it from Sharper Image, but when I was a kid, my nose hair started growing like crazy. And I kept picking the hairs out of my nose. My mom would say, Peter, stop picking the hairs out of your nose. Ah! And so she went out and bought me a hair nose trimmer. And I've had one now for about 40 years. They do come in handy. 
but I don't need it. You know, it's nothing a pair of scissors couldn't do. Oh, these right here, rejuvenating, rejuvenating heated compression leg wraps. Oh my, everybody needs those. And, and it's just, it's presented in such a way to make it look like you're going to be luxurious, like you're going to be happy, like you're, it's going to make your life better, make your life comfortable. I once bought a clock off of here where the, where the clock projects the time on the ceiling and the thing broke in like a month. It just never worked right. And I think a lot of people these days get depressed because they feel they're missing out on something. I think a lot of people feel depressed because they don't have the fancy gadgets, they don't have the fancy car, they don't have the big house, they don't have, you know, the perfect spouse, they don't have the, you know, the cozy little bungalow in the suburbs with 2.5 kids and a golden retriever in the driveway. And I think a lot of people have been scrounging most of their lives, especially the younger people when you're younger and you don't know any better. I, you know, I can only, I can speak from, from my personal point of view. When I was 22 and about to graduate from college, I thought, you know, success was to get a job after college in a big glass, shiny glass building in the, in the city of Cleveland. I had no aspirations or knowledge of Chicago or Detroit or New York or Houston. I, Cleveland was it, man. And it's all I knew. It's all I knew was Ohio. I'd only been to Pennsylvania and Maine. And, you know, you you have this tunnel vision as a kid because, number one, because you don't know any better. You haven't lived, you haven't experienced anything. So you think, oh, my God, if I could only get, oh, jeez, if I could only get, you know, I net perfect woman and find the perfect house and find the perfect job and I'm going to be happy and and if we could just find this, that, and the other thing, you know, and if I could just find this, and if I could just find that. But the problem is, is that's where they get you. They get you on this stuff because you don't know any better. And when you're younger, you start striving for things that never fills up the void in your heart. You start striving for more money. You start striving for better looking uh, mate or spouse. You start striving for a bigger house, a faster car, a better car, a more expensive car. It's all, all revolves around materialistic things. And what you find out as you get older, uh, the bigger the house, the more upkeep it takes. The bigger the house, the more the taxes you pay on it. The bigger the house, the bigger the yard. And the bigger the yard, the more time you're going to spend working in that yard. And if you can afford it, you hire somebody to work in the yard for you, which is more money you've got to spend each month to keep the yard up. The bigger the house, the more expensive it is to heat it and cool it down, the more expensive the utilities are. If you have your blinders on, you're just seeing life through a sharper image that everything's glossy and fun and it's going to be great and keen, you're going to feel empty. You're going to feel like life is meaningless. You're going to feel like there's nothing to look forward to because everything that they sell you in this life is garbage. So if we go over here to the Sharper Image Catalog online, I mean, this is their bestseller page. And if you look at this, I mean, this is their viewing 1 to 24 of 186 items. What have we got here? A bird feeder, a, a, a self-feeding bird feeder, a video camera bird feeder. That's what I need to be happy. Ah, oh, if I could only have that, man, that would make my life would be complete. My life would be complete. Oh, my God. When I get down here, we got a, a rolling wide mouth duffel bag. Oh, man, if I only had one of those, my life would be so much better. Car seat cushion massager with a, and a heater by Sharper Image. I've had one of those. They don't last. The Panasonic rear view mirror by Sharper Image. I've done, I've seen reviews on these, and they don't, they're not always compatible with every car, so you got to make sure your, your car rear view mirror can take them or they'll set up in your electronic system. If not, you've just spent, what is this? $65, $64 on junk. You've got a lot of people on here that are hurting in this country. And I, and I think it's because they've bought into a lot of things that are lies in this country. They, they dangle a carrot in front of you. Another way I like to, to term it is they, they get you chasing your tail. And they get you chasing your tail. They get you chasing after the carrot. They get you keep chasing after things you'll never grasp. 
and they keep telling you you're going to find happiness in all this material stuff. And it's not just material stuff. They try to tell you that, that life is going to be great if you can find the right partner. If, if, they, if she or he looks a certain way and they talk a certain way and they dress a certain way, you're going to find happiness. And then, then you get into relationships. Like when I first started really getting into relationships in college, it was just a shock how bizarre it was. Just how completely bizarre it was how you'd meet all these variety of people in college from all walks of life from around the country. And everybody had their own idea as to what a relationship was. They hadn't been watching the same romantic movies that I had been watching growing up, you know. Marriage gives you an opportunity to stand up above the fray. You get like stand on a platform above all the noise that you stepped out of. Because when you're single, you're kind of like down in, into this in this mosh pit of craziness. And you're just down there banging off of bodies and you're trying to make, you know, trying to make a living on your own. You're trying to meet girls or women. You're trying to socialize. You're trying to be somebody, trying to discover yourself. You're like, ah, ah. It's like this being in this weird, twisted mosh pit. But when you get married, you get kind of pulled out of the mosh pit. You get pulled up on the stage and you can look out over the crowd and go, wow, that's what all of us freaks look like dancing to the music and how crazy it is. And what I discovered is I belong to a lot of like writers groups and artistic and photography groups. And I, uh, a few months ago, I went to a writers group up at a coffee shop on the West side. And I sat down there and, you know, they have these writers groups through meetup.com. And I sat down next to a young lady, you know, probably at least 20 years younger than me. So she's probably 38, may, maybe early 30s, maybe late 20s. I don't know. She looked young. She was young. She looked very um, plain. She looked plain and it's just, she was attractive, but she was plain and very uh, studious looking, nerdy, I guess, if you will. But she was attractive. And I just, it wasn't a hit down. I was like, hey, how's it going? She's like, oh, it's pretty good. How are you doing? And we started chewing the fat, as they say. And I'm kind of like talking to her. And she's like, you know what? The other day I was at one of these meetings. A guy came up to me and told me how pretty he thought I was. And I, I was really upset by that. And I said, why were you upset by that? And she goes, well, you know, at what point can a woman in this country be considered for something other than her looks? At what point can somebody come up to me and look at me for who I am as a human, as a woman? You know, at what point am I going to be accepted for being a person instead of what I look like? And I just kind of sat back. And, and I looked at this this. I looked at this chick, I'm going to say chick, because I just like had a totally different impression of her after she opened her mouth. You know, because, okay, number one, the thing she doesn't realize is that men, biologically, were wired to be attracted visually to the opposite sex. We're very visual creatures. And this isn't just humans. I mean, you look at the cardinals, birds, the birds, the cardinals, not, not the Catholic, the Catholic men. Um, in the robes, but the animals like the, I think the, uh, I might have the, the color scheme wrong, but the male cardinal has a more muted feather and the female cardinal cardinal is brighter red. You know, um, there's, there's certain animals. I can't think of all the animals, but, but we're visual creatures. Men are visual creatures for a reason. It's, it's because we're really here to procreate. You know, we have the different parts between our legs because we're, we're here to make babies. We're not, we're not here to put on some thigh high boots and, you know, get out the Crisco and the rubber sheets. We're here to make babies. Lady wants to wish that men are going to look at her one day as something other than a visual creature, a visual stimulus that's going to draw them in. She can click her heels together and say, I wish guys would change. She, you know, it's going to be like this. Well, you can wish in one hand and crap in the other and see which gets filled first. Uh, because men are wired to be visual creatures for mating reasons. And it's not going to change. It, we're, not going to, it, we're not going to have this, this universal epiphany amongst the male of the species going, you know what, um, that girl that... Uh, 
that wormy looking girl over there, that bookworm of a girl over there with the horn rimmed glasses and her hair, unwashed hair pulled back and the uh, cardigan sweater. Boy, she, her brains, I bet her brains are so hot and attractive. I've got to go talk to her to find out what, what wheels are turning in her mind. I bet you, I bet you she just really pulls off a great conversation. So uh, marriage has given me the opportunity to stand kind of above the fray and see what was going on, what I was immersed in all those years. And you go, oh, I'm so glad I'm not in that anymore, especially now. Especially now when everybody is so confused, their identity, they don't know who they are. Nobody, nobody knows who they are, what they want to be. They don't know where they should go. They don't know what sex they are, what clothes they should wear, what part of the body they should get pierced or tattooed. Nobody knows if they should stay at home or if they should drive or they should move out or if they should stay with their parents or if they should make love to a dog. Everybody is very, 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 very confused. I think a lot of people are hurting like these people on this website, you know, um, because they've been misled. They've been sold a bill of goods. I'll see what this lady has to say. Do you want to talk about how life is so meaningless that nothing matters and then we get into these slumps of not wanting to do anything because we feel like nothing matters so there's no point uh you are correct you know what i mean i don't want to be like pessimistic in any way but i'm going to be because that's who i actually am so well at least she knows who she is i'm a pessimist too i call myself a realist actually you know we go through life um hoping that there's some sort of meaning this is really funny story I did um, an exam to get into film school once. Weird time in my life. That's weird. And it was like this really random question about technology. And then I just went on a whole rant about. Okay. This is the kind of person I would meet in a bookstore to, for a writer's meeting, one of these writer's meetup groups that would just drive me insane. Trying to hold a guy. Life is meaningless. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just don't want to live. Good lord, dude. It's got 48,000 views. I don't want to live. I've been there too. I'll be honest, I've been there. This life can suck pretty bad. Because life's so stressful. It causes me a lot of mental pain. Physical suffering, emotional suffering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the way life is being operated, you know, it's a universal thing. Go to work, make money, pay your bills, achieve goals, be a slave, right? A modern day slave to the job you work for. And to me, that's just bullshit because. What's the point of all that? If it means, in the end, we're all going to die. You know, the story ends one day for each and every single one of us. Well, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, you spend your whole life striving for these ridiculous things that have no meaning. So, of course, life is meaningless. You're, you're working for a job in a, in a company that doesn't give a crap about you. They're paying you pennies just so you'll stick around just enough to keep you around, to keep that dare, carrot dangling in you that you think if you work hard enough, you'll get a raise and you get an extra week of, of vacation and you'll, you'll, you know, it's, it's all meaningless crap. This is why I say we really need to focus on each other, focus on being good to each other as people and stop worrying about the big job and the big car because, you know, when he's right, it's all said and done. You're going to be sitting in a hospital bed, taking your last breath with an IV in your arm and the machine over your shoulder that goes bing. And then eventually your heart's going to stop and your family's either going to be there or not. And you're going to go someplace else. Who knows where you really go. But do you really want to waste your whole life being a modern day slave to some corporate master? It, it, it's, it makes life depressing. And then life is stressful because you try to keep trying to achieve all these goals that they want you to keep making but you're just in a hamster wheel you're not going anywhere they are you know these billionaires that run these companies are off on yachts with leather mistresses they're you know flying to tropical islands they're scuba, scuba diving and skydiving and flying up into space while we sit here pulling our putts trying to make ends meet 
So what's the whole reasoning behind working hard? So I, I thought he was older. He's not older. So let's, let's find somebody that's like close to my age. Even though it's meaningless, it's worth, I guess, doing because it's worth being happy. But unfortunately, like I always say, things get in the way of our true dreams. People thinking working is a dream. What's your dream job? Or what do you want to do? You could be anything you want in life. Meanwhile, the person just wants to do a specific thing, but it may not be beneficial with making this. But it's a dream. But at the same time, no, that is not a dream because we're being forced, literally manipulated into thinking that's a dream. We're just doing that work crap. Because we got to make money, man. You know, we're all just enslaved in that fucking bullshit. And with all this being said, me being an... This is a common theme in all these videos, and this is a common theme in, in, in my thinking as well. I mean, we're slaves. We're modern-day slaves. No, no, we're not chained to a cotton field. You know, with a, with a massa whipping us, um, they've, they've gone beyond that. We're, we're chained to this lifestyle, uh, this capitalistic lifestyle. They've got people chasing after carrots, chasing, chasing after tails. All for the hope of some type of reward, a raise, a bonus, a promotion, a bigger house, a faster car, a better looking wife, a better looking husband. You know, I can't begin to tell you how many people I know that have gotten divorced in the last 40 years that gone on to somebody else to try to find their happiness someplace else. We've all seen that. And they really do. And they divorced that person. I, I have an ex-girlfriend uh, that I dated like 40 years ago that has not been married five times. And, you know, she kept... You know, she dumped me to go to somebody else. We weren't married. We were just dating. And, uh, you know, we all strive, we keep looking for better things. The grass is always greener somewhere. And that's how they keep the economy going. If you buy, if you buy the junk, you know, oh, I mentioned a cardinal. Look at that. There's a card here. Let me get my fat head out of here. There's a cardinal on the cover. As we mentioned, this is the tree topper shop. The, this is the tree topper. This is the bird feeder with a camera in it. But look at the stuff. They keep telling, oh, if, if, you, if you just, if you make enough money, you know, when I was single, I couldn't afford any of this stuff. This stuff is always expensive, and it's expensive junk. It's al crapola, as my mother would say. I mean, why in the world, why in the world do you need a virtual pong uh, game? Or why do you need an oversized lounging hoodie? And this magazine is a microcosm of what makes people unhappy this is a microcosm of life it's all material goods it's all they've got you chasing after material things that they tell you're going to make you happier they're going to make you look better they're going to make you look sexier they're going to make you lighter or stronger and none of this stuff works this guy here this is the original guy that i found on here i don't really love anyone in this world I'm like really alone, like I'm I'm really fucking lonely. All right, I just want to come out here and I want to talk, say something, do something before I feel like I'm going to lose my fucking mind. Can you imagine that? How old is this guy? Good looking kid. Sitting in a nice car with leather seats, I think. Which doesn't matter, right? He's got, it looks like a nice SUV with leather seats. Good looking kid, maybe, maybe 22, and he thinks life sucks and he's lonely and he's never been in love. And I, this guy, when you watch this video, if you, if you have any soul at all and you're not a sociopath, um, you'll, you'll, you'll get choked up watching this kid. I guess I'm trying to get away. And it says, and the title of this one is Life is BS, Rant by Depressed Young Man away from all this shit but you can't it's impossible you have to be around people yeah people fucking suck people don't care about you if you're a little weird or you're a little awkward people fucking hate you they don't want to oh that's true I, i've been weird my whole life i've been i've always been the, the kid that you know after a while i realized everyone thought i was weird so i started sitting in the back of the room when i when the seats weren't assigned in high school i sat at the back of the room just to get away from everyone just so i wouldn't get picked on be around you and they don't care about any of your issues or how you feel whatsoever and and and, and i agree with this guy i mean this 
you know, as I've had people tell me throughout my life, well, people have their own issues. You know, no one's going to come up to you and say, hey, I'm so sorry you're going through that. What can I do to help you out? Most people are so wrapped up in themselves and their own issues. They don't, they don't have time or the energy to help you out with yours. They're just not, it's just not going to happen. That's, that's the truth. I'm just tired of like feeling this way, you know, like, like I'm stuck, I'm trapped, I'm bored. There's nothing to do. Everything about life has to do with other people, and I don't want to be around other people anymore. Yeah, that's the way I used to be. Oh, I'm still that way. I, I, I become more isolated as I've gotten older. But when I was younger, I felt really bored, like there was nothing to do. And this is before I embraced myself as an artist. And I started to really paint and draw and really focus on my artistic, creative side. Before then, I just tinkered around with the guitar. I never really took it seriously. I took it seriously for the first couple of years. And then I gave it up when I went to college because there were guys that I went to college with who were a lot better than me and I had no self-confidence. So I gave up the guitar, stopped playing it until um, my early 20s, my late 20s, not my, my mid-20s, right after college, just started playing again. And um, I think this young man probably has not found himself. And most people don't, most people aren't blessed enough to find themselves, truly know who they are at the age of 22. All it is is disappointment every time. It's like they want you to be a certain way, but I can't be that way. I feel like I'm not supposed to be a part of this society. I don't fit in it. It's like really fucking irritating, man. Well, you're not alone, dude. I don't know if this young man will hear me, but until you find yourself, um, people used to tell me this. They say, oh, I just don't care. You know, Pete, just let it roll off your shoulders. Just be who you want to be, you know, just let it be who you want to be. It's the truth. I, I hate to admit it, but I didn't want to listen to him. I thought I already knew myself, but I didn't know myself when I was your age, dude. And you, you're you going to have to do a lot of soul searching and, and playing around. I don't mean playing around like, like sexual. I mean, like experimenting, see who you want to be. And um, if you have a passion, if you have a dream or a goal, like for me, I always want to be an artist. And I, I never, I always ran away from it because it, I didn't think it would make me any money. But Money doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if, you know, I mean, it matters in the sense that you've got to put food in the table. Um, and I was fortunate enough to meet my wife who made a serious living and allowed me to be the artist. But even if I didn't have her, I could still do Uber Eats or I could still work at Walmart and do my art on the weekends or do my art at night. So you're bored right now and you think you don't fit in because you've not embraced who you really are and you're trying to fit in. You're trying to be all these other idiot people around you who think they know who they are, but they're all just playing a game. They're just playing a role on a movie. I want to just drive away. Like I'm here in the back of the parking lot and I just want to be by myself. This is like the most peaceful for me to so just be on my own, just away from people. It's, you know, I try so hard to like, to try and be normal, to be kind to others, um, to try and just fit in and create like relationships, but it's like impossible. I don't know. People just, if they don't like you, they don't like you. And it is what it is. You know, that's life. Life is bullshit. If you were born a certain way, like there's nothing you can do about it. Well, in, in this guy is going through the same things. I think I, I know I went through, I can speak for all of you, but you know, you grow up, and I kind of had had good instincts and didn't know it. Like like in high school, I tried. I'm an I can be very athletic. I'm a very athletic guy, but I didn't have the desire to be an athlete. I didn't have the the burning desire to constantly go out there and play football and bash my head in against these behemoth guys. And so I quit football. It just wasn't in me. So I kind of knew. And and as I said early in the in the marriage, marriage gives you a chance to stand up above the fray. When I quit sports and got the chance to step back from all the jocks that I was surrounded by, I realized they were all like idiots. You know, hey, football is all they talked about. So one guy is all he talks about football and mountain climbing. You know, so he's done his whole life football and mountain climbing. You know, so he is. You know, but I'm not. I'm not the Neanderthal type. I'm just not. I'm more of an intellectual artist. I don't even know if I'm an intellectual. I'm a pseudo-intellectual probably. But, you know, you, you try to fit into this crowd. I try to fit in with the jocks. And I just, 
it wasn't me. They all had this bravado and this charisma that was just like, what is this bullshit? You guys walk around with your letter jackets on in the hallway and, and you're not even on it. I mean, my high school football team sucked. We were, we were always at the bottom of our division. We stunk. And it's like, what, what, you're walking around like you're all down a bag of chips and you're in the worst football team in the division. I was like, what's the point? It, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. You're, you know, you still suck. And there's a reason the team sucked. I'm not going to go into that. But you try to fit in. You try to feel like you're part of something because that's what you think you're supposed to do. It's what you think you're supposed to do. You got to go fit in with the jocks, you know. And it doesn't work. You know, I could have been I could have been a good athlete. I wanted to be a baseball player, but I, I never got a chance to play organized baseball because mom and dad were drinking the money away. And uh, nobody wanted to sit out there and spend the money and get me to join Little League and buy the uniforms and all that stuff. So I I never got to play baseball. I'm not going to blame it all on them, but you're seven years old. How, even if I had the motivation, how do I play, you know, how do I play Little League baseball without the ability to have a bat, a ball, and a glove? And, like, that'll always be a negative on you. It's easier for other people and it'll be harder for you. No, that's not true. It'll always be harder for you. Once you realize, you're realizing that the other people are idiots and that you're different, once you accept your difference, and your eccentricities, and you like them, and you begin to like yourself, you'll realize you don't need to be like those other people, and it won't affect your life as much, because you'll start being who you're meant to be, and you'll start hanging around people that are more like you. I feel like most of life is decided from the moment you're born, depending on what location you're in, what kind of people are around you in the neighborhood you grew up in, what kind of family you have. All of that is decided from the moment you're born, and will impact everything else in your life. I'm going to comment on that, too, because, okay, I was born into a shit family. I was born into Hurricane Nancy and Harry. My parents were volatile alcoholics. And it, we were poor, we were homeless. It was it was nasty. And it wasn't as bad as some kids have, because I've, I've met other people who have had worse than I did. They were physically and uh, mentally and sexually abused. I was just mentally and emotionally abused. I, I don't believe... At least I don't think I was sexually abused by either of my parents. I know my mother didn't do anything to me. I don't I don't believe my father did, but I never got physically abused by my parents. And I can tell you that it did shape me, that it has shaped me who I am today. I am very tight with my money. I'm very paranoid. I'm very suspicious of other people. I'm very um on guard around people. I'm waiting, always waiting for the other shoe to fall. Most of the time in my life, it hasn't happened. I've had a few situations in my life where people have done things to me that I wasn't expecting because I wasn't being truthful to myself. But you'll see that you'll your circumstances can define you if you let them. But in my situation, I've always been determined to grow out of that. I've always been determined to mentally and emotionally evolve from the hurricane even though the hurricane devastated the first like 10 years of my childhood, the rest of it, the storm passed. Things got better to some degree, at least for me. For my mother, they kind of did, and they kind of got worse for her and much worse for my father. But you'll find that you'll grow from it and you'll, you'll evolve and you'll take a different course. Uh, your life will go on a different course if you make the mental effort to change direction. Any time now, confused. So, if you had a fucked up family life, it's too late. Like, that already has a big effect on you, and you are going to f- use the rest of your life to try and fucking counteract all that bullshit that happened to you. I hate to say that. That's kind of true. It's not going to affect everything, and you can get f- away from but it takes a long time. It takes, for me, it's taken a long time to go, okay, my parents are fucked up, my family's kind of screwy. How do I get over this? You you have to make a conscientious and a conscious effort to go, okay, I my family doesn't make me. But as I said in my podcast about being an adult child of alcoholic parents, um, their addiction affects you much like a virgin piece of wood that is that gets stained. So if you have a virgin piece of vine, uh, a virgin piece of pine, and you put stain on it, that stain sinks into the fibers of the wood board 
And the only way to bring that piece of wood back to its virginal state of just white pine is to sand it and scrape it and sand it and scrape it until you get all that gunk out of the fibers. So it's going to take you years of just wrestling with yourself and with your past to get to a new place. And I can tell you that once you get there, once you once you win the wrestling match, it's a very fulfilling feeling of accomplishment. It's a, it's a battle you can win. Like it's really all about luck in that way. But life is bullshit. That's what it is. Life is bullshit. And no matter how hard I cry or fucking complain about it, it's not going to change. Right? This is just reality. I can dream about it. I can daydream all day about something better. But like this is reality. So I have to make what I can of it, right? Because we're all going to fucking die someday anyways. So I just have to make what good I can of it. Like whatever I can get out of this life. And whether it's making stupid videos, and I know no one's going to watch this. No one's going to give a fuck or care about That's not true. You're, you're cut off. You're, you're bullshitting us now. You made this, you made this video because you want people to watch it, and you know people are going to watch it. And you know, how many views have you gotten? You, you've had to have a sizable amount of views by now because I know a lot of people have commented on this video. I feel like no one gives a shit or cares about the problems I have or can relate to them. Nobody does. I mean, and that's the truth of it. As I said, everybody's struggling with their own issues. Uh, and my mom used to tell me this, and people have told me this, Mahala. But you don't understand. Nobody want, cares about your issues because they've got issues of their own. And, and some of my, the things my mother would say to me were harsh, but I would complain about things to her. My mom t and I talked all the time. We had an open line of communication. It wasn't like we sat down and I said, well, she'd say, Wilson, let's have an open line of communication. Let's talk about your dating life. Now, I volunteered that information to her, <laughs> much to her um, distaste. She didn't want to hear about my dating life, but I would be complaining with somebody that broke up with me or uh, a relationship. She'd say, well, Peter, doesn't work out like that. She goes, hey, uh, where do you think that everything works out just perfectly? You know, it doesn't work that way. Life doesn't work that way. And I'm oh, you don't understand, Mom. And, I, and then it never occurred to me to sit back and think about my mother's life that was wrecked because of the man she married. It was one of the reasons, anyway. It wasn't the only reason. But, it, you know, my mom found this gorgeous guy that was tall, dark, and handsome. And he was the strong, silent type. And she fell for him. And she, she wouldn't let go of this guy. She was obsessed with my father. And life didn't work out for her either. So I don't know why I didn't see that till I was well, long. My mother had been dead years, and I went, oh, shit. Mom's life didn't turn out the way she had hoped, or dad's probably for that matter. Um, life doesn't turn out the way you want it to. Um, and it takes a lot of hard work. I want to try and do something where I put it online, and I hope that people can listen and at least relate a little bit. That someone has the same issues. You know, I... I don't really love anyone in this world. He hesitated when he said that. He must love his parents or something. You know, I don't know. And there's times where I feel like that, you know, when I was single especially, it was just like, oh, shit. You know, all my friends were getting married. You know, everybody was having kids, moving away. You know, all the guys I grew up with moved away or they, you know, they stopped being friends with me for a variety of reasons. And you started to sit back and go, oh, shit, you know, what's wrong with me? And I had a friend, uh, my friend Brian, he and I would hang out all the time, and we were hitting our late 30s, and he wasn't married. And he said, you know, people are going to start thinking we're gay, like we're a gay couple because we hang out all the time. And I had never thought about that. We both laughed, and, you know, it, you know, I didn't care one way or the other what people thought, but society has a weird way of pigeonholing you, making you think you should be a certain way by a certain age. But... Love is a weird thing, man. There's people that love you that you have no idea that love you. I found that out. And there's people that, uh, like I said, are wrapped up in their own lives and they're not going to tell you. They're not, they don't have time to come and talk to you and hold your hand and tell you, I'm sorry, I love you, I miss you. I know uh, people aren't sentimental anymore. Um, I think the sentimental era ended with, with my parents, my parents' age. People that were born in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s were sentimental because they were raised to be sentimental. Um, my mother was very sentimental and nostalgic. But like my wife's family, there's no, nostal no nostalgia there. There's no sentimentality. It's all, you know, passes over, let's move on kind of attitude. 
So you're you're gonna meet all kinds. I'm like really alone. Like I'm I'm really fucking lonely. Like to a devastating extent. Like I'm I'm such a loner. Like it's just my whole life. That's all I'm used to is being by myself. And I want to connect to someone. It, to me, like the the thought of being close to someone almost seems like a faraway dream. Like it doesn't even seem like something that's real. Yet it's so normal for other people. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't believe that everybody else has the life you think they have. And you say you're completely alone. And this is what people told me when I was your age. They said, "Go out and do something." You know, my mom would say, "Go out and run around the block." You know, go go walk the dog. You know. And I'd be like, oh, fuck you, mom. And she'd like, don't talk to me like that. We'd have these huge arguments. And, and my siblings don't know the things that I had to, f- to say to my mom. I, I said all the things to my mother that they wish they could say to her. But she was right about a lot of the stuff she said back to me. She's like, go out and do something. You know, get off your ass and go to the library or go meet somebody. Go go join a group. My uncle would say, go, go take an art class or, you know, go join a book club. Or uh, my uncle kept trying to get me to join... Um, Toast Toastmasters, because I I studied public speaking in college, and I was like, oh whatever, Uncle Ray, whatever, you know, I didn't speak like that to him, but, um, but I don't know if this guy hears me or not, but you got to get up and go do something. You have to. That's the truth. What what my uncle and my mother said was perfect advice. Go out and meet some people. I mean, if you're a writer, dude, or if you're a musician, or if you're a painter, or if you're like basket weaving, or if you're like to build model cars if you're a nerd and you like you know dungeons and dragons or you like video games go online and meet some there's million millions of video gamers out there join a, a group that gets together every night and plays i don't know this is philadelphia story jimmy stewart hit Catherine hepburn and this this is uh i think what people think when they think of intimacy today even today i think people have been poisoned by romanticism about relationships and and I can tell you this I've dated hundreds of people before I met my wife and including my wife and I have never had a situation like this and anytime I try to be romantic and say things like this to a woman they'd be like oh uh, check please ah uh, nice knowing you Pete I'm out of here Tracy what are you over you're wonderful <laughs> Tracy you're wonderful there's a magnificence in you, Tracy. And the music, the swelling violins come in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm getting self-conscious. It's funny, I... Right, that's... Yeah. I don't know. Boom, throw up, I guess. It's fate. A magnificence that comes out of your eyes and your voice and the way you stand there and the way you walk. You're lit from within, Tracy. <laughs> You're lit from within? I mean, can you imagine saying this to a woman in, in the 21st century while you're at dinner at Applebee's or something? Tracy, you're lit from within and I want to bury my head between your legs, deep between your legs. <laughs> You've got fires bang down in you. Fires banging down in you. Earth fires. What? Holocaust. Look at her. She's all overcome with emotion. I don't seem to be made of bronze. You or you're made out of flesh and blood. That's the black and holy surprise of it. We are the gold of the girl. You're the golden girl. So loving life and warmth and delight. Oh, what goes on? You got tears in your eyes. Shut up. Shut up. I just wet myself. Oh, Mike, keep talking. Keep talking. Keep talking. Hey, oh, no, I. I just came in my pants. I have to stop. <laughs> no, I think people have an unrealistic viewpoint as to what romance and love is. See, when I was a kid, um, as dysfunctional as my parents were, my mother was always the one that came to the rescue. I, I had a sibling that anytime I got hurt, 
my sibling would laugh hysterically. This person thought it was the funniest thing to see me skin my knee and bleed or get hurt. And anytime I got hurt, my mom would hear me scream and cry. She'd come running in and swoop me up off the ground, you know, clean up my wounds, bandage them, give me a kiss. And, you know, I remember one time I had these sleepers on. Sleepers are like this one piece pajama thing with feet sewn in to the bottom. The, 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 those pant legs had feet sewn into the little rubber pads on the bottom to protect your feet. So I'm, I'm running down the stairs, uh, the back stairs of her house, and I trip and I fall, and I bit my tongue, and I'm, my mouth is bleeding. And then just as I fell, my parents had come in from a night out of doing something, uh, drinking or something. I don't know what they were doing. But they came in, they were all gussied up, and I'm screaming and crying at the, on the landing stairs of the steps. And my mother came rushing in, and she, she got me some Coca-Cola because she said that would make my tongue feel better. And, you know, she was always coming in to rescue me. But as you get older, and, you know, my mother's been dead for 30, God, how long has mom been gone? 30 years now? 32 years. She's been gone for 32 years. And, you know, when your mother goes and you don't have that person who genuinely cares about you because you're of her flesh and blood, it's hard to find another person who's going to come swooping in and say, oh, you know what? I really, oh, you're going through all that right now? Oh, my God, here's some Coca-Cola for you. Let me pat your head. Let me let me bandage your wounds. Not a, you know, my wife um, isn't that kind of person. And you're not really going to find another person like that. And if you didn't have that as a mother to begin with, you're going to spend a good portion of your life trying to find someone to kind of be your, your superhero to come in and, and save you. So there's a variety of things that I experienced as a kid where I had to find a way to cope with my situation at home. So I'm seven years old, I'm in first grade, and things are horrible at home. My, both my parents are alcoholics. They're beating the hell out of each other. We're on food stamps, we have no food in the house. We're constantly being threatened by the management of the apartment we lived in to be thrown out. One winter, one of the coldest winters in Ohio at the time, he turned off the heat in our building to try to get us out of the building. I got pneumonia, got sick. A whole bunch of horrible things are going on. I'm home alone. My oldest, two oldest siblings had moved out. They got married and moved out. My brother, closest to me in age, um, had, was gone a lot because he turned 15 and learned to drive and got a car and was working sick and shift in, at a local uh, restaurant. So I'm home alone with my parents a lot. And the situation was gone awful. So I found sanctuary in television. And I started to watch shows like The Brady Bunch, Family Affair, The Courtship of Eddie's Father. And I started to believe that a lot of these shows were real. I started to, you know, I was desperate to find an answer to what was happening in my life, but I, I would watch these shows and I'd be like, wow, there's got to be something better than this out there. there. There's families out there that are better than mine. You mean there's people out there that think rationally and don't fight and don't get drunk? And I, I believe that like the Brady Bunch and you know, Family Affair with uh, Brian Keith and Courtship of Eddie's Father were real. I, I don't know if I initially believe they were real, but I believe there were real families out there like this. There had to be something better out there. And, you know, you know, I, I thought for sure that there were scenes like with, with this scene with, with, um, Mr. Brady, you know, where they've, they've discovered that, you know, um, Greg has been smoking cigarettes and this is kind of funny, you know, you watch this and, and how they calmly and rashly talked to him about smoking cigarettes. I thought there were people out there like this. Oh, is wrong just to go along with the guys. It's stupid. Yeah, it's not a very good excuse. I'm afraid it's no excuse. Well, look, we don't want you to smoke. Eventually, you'll have to make your own decision. I hope it's the right one, but for now... I've blown the chance to play at the dance and get that loan to fix my amp. No, I gave you my word on that, and I intend to keep it. Well, I must have some punishment coming. Look, Greg, if you know what you did wrong, I mean, that's more important than any punishment we could think of. Well, I do, Mom. I really do. Well, after all... When I was young, I smoked. 
Yes, honey, but we didn't have all the evidence that we do now. You're so, I mean, I would watch shows like this and I'd be like, oh, there's a calm, sober, rational mother and father that are calmly talking through the situation with calm, placid voices, rationally thinking through the, the situation and coming up with calm, reasonable solutions. You know, as a little kid, I would eat this stuff up. Little did I know, you know, little did I know that, uh, you know, this show was totally baloney. You don't know when you're seven years old. Like, for instance, the guy that plays Mr. Brady or Mike Brady in a TV show, Robert Reed. Robert Reed was a homosexual man in real life. And he hated working on this show. He despised it. He was a Shakespearean trained actor who despised working in television. And I can't blame him. Here's a man who had phenomenal skills as a Shakespearean thespian. He was he was probably yearning to be on the stage and to to be doing all the things he was trained to do. And here he's stuck in this sappy, saccharine, sweet bullshit TV show. But the point I'm making here is that the show was was founded off of lies. It did the basic foundation, the premise is an entire lie because number one, it's it's, it's fantasy, it's fiction. Number two, the character Mr. Brady is a homosexual man who wouldn't ever be married to someone like Mrs. Brady with with three kids of his own. He could be back then he could be because homosexuality was still considered illegal and men and women both who were gay back then had to hide in the closet, so to speak, in the closet or literally in the closet. They had to hide their true their true life and they lived these miserable lives as heterosexual men. You know the story. And then there were other shows that I watched such as, you know, Family Affair. And I'll show you this here. Now, this is one. It's kind of an obscure one. I don't know if they still show it in reruns. But Brian Keith is a single dad, and he's got two kids. And when I was little, it never occurred to me that he was single. He has three kids, I think. He has Buffy, Jody, and there was an older daughter. I can't remember the older daughter's name. But he's single. But when I was little, it never occurred to me that he was single, a single dad. I think he might have just have been, he might have been their uncle. Come to think of it, what is the premise to this show? Now that I'm a grown-up, I'm a grown-up man. I think it's kind of a really kind of a depressing scenario. Family affair. TV show. Okay, so let's pull this up. So the Family Fear TV show starred Brian Keith and Sebastian Cabot, aired on CBS from September 12, 1966. Just a little less than a year. I was almost a year old. To March 4th of 71. And the series explored the trials of well-to-do engineer and bachelor uh, Bill Davis, who is Brian Keith, as he attempted to raise his brother's orphaned children in his luxury New York City apartment. Um, so I'm guessing his brother died. Let's see here, that because he became saddled with the responsibility of caring for a 15-year-old sissy. Uh, sissy is the older daughter. Kathy Garber is the, is the actress. And the six-year-old twins, Jody, which is Johnny Whitaker, and Buffy, which is Anissa Jones. Um... So if they were orphaned, I'm, I'm guessing that their father had died, their mother and father had died and left them as orphans. So so the point I'm making here is, okay, so I'm watching this show as a seven-year-old. The, sh the, sh the show stopped airing in 1971 when I was six or seven. No, I was probably six. But it was in reruns shortly after that went to syndication. And so I'm watching this thinking, oh, there's this great father and this great two, two you know, great older sister, Sissy, and there's... Buffy and Joe, and they get all these comical things, and Brian Keith is this, is this caring actor, and I thought Brian Keith looked a little bit like my dad, and I thought this is real. I thought there were really families out there like this. So you go through life, and you think, oh, there's, there, you know, when you're, when you're in a, a traumatic situation, you're looking for escape. You're looking for some way to get out of that situation. If you have no physical way to escape, like I didn't because I was too young, 
I escaped into a fantasy world of TV and music. I escaped into the music of the Beatles. So I think what you have today is you have a lot of people who are making these life is meaningless videos because they're, a lot of the younger people, I think, are discovering that life is kind of all a lie. Just as I discovered. I discovered that the TV shows are complete bullshit. I still have yet to find anybody that has the family affair kind of life. But even the Brady Bunch is a story based off of two people that are divorced, I think. Uh, or maybe Mr. Brady's wife died and Mrs. Brady's husband died and they got together. But still, it's, it's a broken, two broken families that get together and have to m- merge three different kids, six kids together from two different families into one household under the same roof. And they all just happily get along together. You know, they just happen to all get along. And they're all beautiful and they're funny and they're witty and they're athletic and and they're musicians and stuff like that. But I have yet to find families like this in the real world. I mean, I grew up with a lot of people. And as I've gotten older and I've told my story about um, my dysfunctional family, I found that everybody has their version of a dysfunctional family. Nobody has the Brady Bunch. Nobody has family affair. Nobody has facts of life or any of this stuff. You know, nobody has the Huxtables. Nobody has Bill Cosby as a, as a doctor father and a mother that's a doctor and they're living in some swanky estate somewhere and having a great time. You know, what you hear about is the father's depressed because he's a surgeon and he's about to kill himself, you know, and the mother's off sleeping with the pool boy. That's, that's the reality. That's what re- reality is. So we're raised off of these fables. We're raised off of these fairy tales. And a lot of us buy into it because we're looking for a way to medicate ourselves or looking for sanctuary from the pain of it all. And Hollywood tells us that there is an escape, that there's this, there's never, never land, you know? There's no place like home. Follow the yellow brick road. Other scene from It's a Wonderful Life, which is made in 1946 with Jimmy Stewart. I don't know who the actress is here. But um, this is another impassioned uh, film. And I saw this when I was in college for the first time. And I I just, you know, I thought life could really work like this. I thought, well, people are going to come and help me, you know, in a tough time. The people in the community are going to come and gather money when I have a hard time. And they're going to get around and gather me up because I'm a good fella from my small hometown. But anyway, he's talking to her here and hear what he says here. What? You, You want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Pull it down and pull down the moon? I got the moon for him. Here. Here, Mary. I got the moon for you, Mary. Does that do it for you, Mary? Do you like me better now, Mary? I got the moon for you, Mary. The moon, I'm telling you. The moon. Daddy, Daddy, he got me the moon. What do I do? You should marry him. You should marry him and get on your knees and serve her some orally. Hey, that's a pretty good idea. I'll give you the moon, Mary. I'll take it. Then what? I'll well, then bang you. Swallow it, and it all dissolves. <laughs> You'll swallow it, and the moonbeams that shoot out of your fingers and your toes and the ends of your hair. I'd run if I was a. I'd be, well, what are you talking about, there, Jimmy? Uh, I I got I got to go wash the cat. See you later, buddy. Am I talking too much? You sure. Yes. <laughs> Why don't you kiss her instead of talking to her to death? How was I? You mount the woman, son. <laughs> and here's here's another show that I watched. Um, here's Family Affair. Now, Family Affairs, I told you about this guy that is this bachelor that was, you know, saddled with three kids because his brother and his wife kicked the bucket and they died in a car crash or something. This is a show from 1967. And this is Brian Keith um, talking to his daughter, whose name is um, Jody, And she has Mrs. Beasley as her favorite doll. And she's laying in bed. And I think she's talking about an invisible bear. And uh, keep, keep in mind, now think about the premise of this show. These kids lost their parents or lost their dad or something. There'd be huge trauma going on with all these kids. There'd be trauma like nightmares and sadness and depression and all kinds of stuff. Even in 1967, yes. But there's none of that in this. These kids are so well adjusted because, you know, Brian Keith, Uncle Keith came swooping into the rescue. I'm going to ask you something, and I want you to tell me 
100% truth, okay? Okay. Can you really see Arthur? No, Uncle Pam. I'm shy. But it was fun while it lasted. Anyway, I like Mrs. Beasley better than a big old bear. You know, in the, the sacred suite, you know, flutes and violins are playing a, a song in a major key and a happy, upbeat, la, da, 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 as the little kid admits she can't see the, the invisible bear. And Brian Keith is the, the all-loving uncle. It's like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so do I. Good night. Good night, Uncle Bill. But look at this, he's so well dressed. He's he's in good shape and this guy's probably fifty years old right there and he's a happy, positive he's probably going downstairs to throw back a few because he's been saddled with these little crazy kids. So I grew up with a lot of this stuff and so when I watch these Life is meaningless videos, I I watch some of these young people and I just can only imagine what they're going through if these are real authentic people. Look at this. Look at this guy. He looks like Ralph Macchio, doesn't he? Yeah, dude. You're a good-looking kid. Say, stop, stop. Oh, no, you don't look like Jack Lemmon. Let me, let me find Ralph Macchio again here. There he is. Ralph Macchio. Meet Mari. Dude. Move to Hollywood or something. Try to get in the movies. Smile a little bit. That's what people always tell me. Smile. You gotta learn to smile. There we go. That's got to boost your ego a little bit. You're a good-looking kid. Maybe you should take some acting lessons or something. I don't know, man. I'm P.T. Pop. I'm going to sign off here. I've been rambling on for hours. I've got to edit this all down now. Maybe I'll just put it all out there. Put a two-hour video out there. YouTube wants longer videos now, so what the hell. All right. I'm signing off, everybody. I hope you're all having a good week. I'm P.T. Pop. Call Center Survivor. Be safe, everyone. Peace and love.